So I think a stylized fact that we know from the literature is that successful interventions tend to compensate this lack of family support really early in life. So early childhood intervention programs can often have strong impacts on for children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And by contrast, the received wisdom, I think, is that later interventions that set down in schools or in labor markets are much less successful. But I think it's fair to say that pretty little attention has been given to later interventions that provide personal support from other adults. So they directly go at this defining characteristic that there's a lack of support from adults and try to substitute it um, by somebody else. And this is exactly the approach taken by mentoring programs. So they do provide support that these disadvantaged family environments do not provide. And so what we're gonna do in this paper is we, we, we want to evaluate whether mentoring can in fact improve the labor market prospects of disadvantaged adolescents. So think about 14 year olds roughly. Um, we implemented a, a, a randomized controlled trial in RCT of a nationwide German mentoring program. And so to, to, so you get an idea where we are going. Here are the main results we'll, we'll get to. If you just subdivide our sample in half by the socioeconomic status, the, the low SDS uh, adolescents, um, for them, the mentoring uh, significantly increases the three outcome dimensions that we're looking at. And we're also uh, showing in an appendix that these outcome dimensions are highly predictive for, for labor market success later on. So these adolescents, when we observe them, are still in school, but we try to measure things that are then good predictors of, uh, of their labor market success later. And these are three dimensions. The one is, first one is really the cognitive dimension of, of math grades in school. The second you may call like a behavioral uh, component, let me patience and social skills, which are also very relevant for, for the labor market. And the third one is like what you could call a, a volitional component, so the labor market orientation. And what we see is that if we just do a combined outcome index of these three outcomes, that increases by half a standard deviation after one year. So this effect is really huge. Um, and we show in a mediation analysis that at least part of this treatment effect emerges if and when uh, the program is successful in establishing these mentors as attachment figures who provide guidance uh, for, for future. So really where, where these adolescents can talk to and all of a sudden think about it. And that's apparently something that in general families provide. And if it's not provided in the families, this program seems to be successful in achieving its goals. By contrast, if you like the, the upper half of the SES distribution, these higher SES uh, adolescents, the program is not effective. We don't see a significant effect. So the bottom line, what I want you to take, to take away from, from this year is that individualized adult support that substitutes family support where, is this, where it is lacking. So where it's really uh, uh, in the low SES part, there it does help disadvantaged children even uh, at adolescence age uh, to improve their, their fates. Okay. Um, just very quickly, where we, where we enter the literature here, I mean, there, there have been a, a few recent studies that did RCTs um, where mentoring is part of a more comprehensive support program. So mentoring uh, is joined with uh, things like financial incentives, academic tutoring, and any uh, additional educational services. They all find interesting effects in the short run, uh, partly different in, in the medium term, but while it's very important to see and learn that these support programs work, uh, we cannot really deduct what, what's the contribution of mentoring or whether mentoring is really crucial here or not. Then there are a lot of studies on, on mentoring programs themselves, but they are mostly non-experimental. And if you think that these mentoring programs go to very disadvantaged population, you can easily think how hard it is to think about to, to get the right counterfactual. Um, and the main exception here is this, this famous US program called Big Brothers, Big Sisters. It's been evaluated mostly for, for younger children uh, in, in two, uh, by two studies, two RCTs. The first one is actually more than a quarter of a century old by now. And there, like in our case, uh, it was implemented in an out of school uh, format with adult mentors. And they found positive effects uh, on reduction in, in drug abuse uh, uh, and absenteeism, but not in other dimensions. And uh, the second study is actually somewhat different program already. So it was implemented within schools. The mentors were mostly high school students, not adults. And they found effects on school achievement, which you can easily see from other high school students, but they actually didn't find any effects on non-cognitive outcomes. I guess most importantly, this 
program wasn't particularly aimed at improving labor market pro prospects and the, the, the evaluation, evaluation studies also didn't look at that. Whereas this is really the core focus of our program and of our evaluation. Um, I should also mention that there's been recently a couple of very interesting mentoring studies at the elementary school level, but of course they, for example, don't look at labor market prospects because these are young children uh, there. And, and this whole concept of mentoring is also related to tutoring, but I should emphasize that at least conceptually, it's quite distinct. So tutoring is not about building relationships like, like mentoring. It's really about just the instruction of academic content. So these, these may overlap because it's often also individualized or small group interventions, but, but what is done and, and what is aimed for is uh, actually quite distinct. So what is our program? The monitoring program that we are studying is called Rock Your Life. It's been set up in 2008 by a group of university students in Germany. And since then has established more than 7,000 mentoring relationships. And these are one-to-one -one mentoring. So each of the adolescents here gets a university student as a, a mentor and they're volunteers. Um, the adolescents are uh, on, on average 14 years old in our sample. They are drawn from the low track schools in Germany. So in Germany, we have this track school system and <clears throat> these, these men this mentoring program goes to, to the lowest track schools in the very disadvantaged neighborhoods of the specific university town. And then they talk, like uh, recruit uh, students there who want to participate. And it's generally set up to run for one year with the option of, uh, of a second year. Um, and these are generally meant to be the last years in school because they want to prepare for the labor market. And the main objective so explicitly is this successful transition uh, of these adolescents uh, into professional life, which in Germany mostly means here from lower secondary school, which ends either after grade nine or 10, either into an apprenticeship or into upper secondary school. But for these students in the lowest track, the apprenticeship will generally be the, the best uh, option. And so they wanna support these adolescents to develop their individual potential, their personal skills, but also their school situation. And so the core of the program um, uh, is that mentors and mentees meet uh, at a one-to-one -one level uh, with the general idea that you meet every other week. So every two weeks uh, they meet. These <clears throat> meetings are meant to be focused on career or orientation, on school assistance, but also on leisure activities. So they would often start out just by meeting, like going to the cinema together or the zoo. And then after a while, they would start talking about uh, the future. Uh, and the program is organized as a social franchise, which means that there's a centralized concept and a centralized support structure, but then really the implementation is in pretty self-governing locations, uh, more than 40 by now across all across Germany. So what did we do? How did we go in to evaluate this program? So we did go into 10 of these locations all over Germany, seven different states, um, uh, into data collection. We set it up as two cohorts. In addition, there were pilots which means that actually altogether, we've been in the field for more than five years. Uh, so this was a very long <laughs> and intensive uh, study. Um, we basically talked to each of these locations and said, look, if there's more students than you can serve, this is kind of the precondition and they, they should aim to have get this, this um, oversubscription, then you can uh, then rather than taking any other uh, uh, measure, we want to randomize who gets in. And that's usually the fairest way of doing that. And that actually did, did work quite well. So whenever there was oversubscription in local schools, more men, men, like interested students, then they have mentors, we would do randomization. Otherwise, we didn't any, uh, alter anything about the program. We did a baseline survey before the program start in each specific uh, site and, and time, which was a paper and pencil uh, survey that was administered by our project team in the schools. Um, then we did a randomized treatment assignment. This was done within each site and cohort. So it's already sure that there's a perfect matching of regional and local environments of treatment and control group. And then we actually did this pairwise matching, which basically means like you create based on these observables in the baseline survey pairs, statistical twins of students that look as same as possible. And then you just randomize within this pair, which is a like super, gives you a lot of efficiency and, and uh, ensures internal validity, even if there's attrition. Um, so our uh, analysis sample are 308 adolescents in these, these different city locations. Um, uh, let me skip all the details there. And then we put in a lot of effort to get these students again one year after program start. 
So effectively, we had to be like we once counted more than 100 person trips to these participating schools from our uh, team for data collection, which did allow us really to manage to get a recontact rate of 99%. So it's only four out of three, these 308 uh, participants whom we didn't get data on one year after treatment. Um, two elements of this, we did our own follow-up survey in the, the schools and we, we got allowance and then went into all these schools to get the administrative great information from the schools, from the school archives. Balancing is uh, wonderful with this uh, setup. So I just want to skip that. Um, what are we going to look at? We've got three outcome dimensions um, that we basically chose because they are highly predictive of adolescents' later labor market success. Um, we actually have a long appendix here, which is the one thing where, where we directly relate and work with PIAC data, because with PIAC data, you can nicely show that all these three dimensions are very strongly predictive of labor market outcomes. The first one is this cognitive component, you might say, is math grades in school. That, so this is the administrative data. The second one uh, is different uh, measures of patience and social skills. And the third one uh, is what we call labor market orientation. It's, it's mostly driven by this, this uh, item on whether they would like to do an apprenticeship after school. So whether they really have an idea of what, what, what they want to do after school uh, on the labor market. And we're going to combine this into one index, just averaging across these three, but also going to show uh, separate results. Final thing we need before we get to the results is um, uh, a measure of, of socioeconomic background. So basically, the program targeted um, low SES children, and we had in mind that it's successful there based on the story that I was telling you initially. Mainly in our evaluation, we learned that um, there's actually quite a chunk in there that you wouldn't quite call low SES. And there, the, like, the expected effect is less clear because the, the lack of family support isn't as clear. And so we want to separate our sample by SES and, and the Results that I'm going showing uh, going to show you. It's a very simple one, which I like a lot, which is this, this measure of the books at home categories uh, that we have in our questionnaire. And we just take the lowest two categories, which is really low, which is roughly half of our sample. And we call that low SES, which in the ever like in a representative German study of, of this age is like 23% of a population. So think about this like the median person in the low SES subsample is as at, at the 11th percentile of the distribution. So these are really disadvantaged students. And the others we call higher SES. So they're not super high SES, but actually better off. Uh, and, and we're going to see that results really differ. So here's the main results. We standardize uh, the outcome to have uh, um, mean zero standard deviation one in the control group. Um, and this is the index of labor market prospects that's just averages across these three outcomes. And we see there's a treatment effect of roughly 15% of a standard deviation in the full sample that's marginally significant, but that really hides a big heterogeneity because here's what we see for the low SES sample. So they, like in the control group, they're like even in this outcome measure, as you would expect, are highly disadvantaged, but the treatment effect uh, is uh, more than half a standard deviation, highly significant. So is a huge effect on this group. Whereas uh, this is the higher SES subsample, we don't see a significant treatment effect. If anything, it's negative. And the effect among the low SES sample is really as, as large as to close the entire um, uh, SES gap in the control group. So I'm running out of time. I'm uh, not giving you all the details here. You can like, if you estimate this parametrically, like this is the higher, uh, the, the SES gap, it's roughly half a standard deviation and our treatment effect closes this fully. Whereas the treatment effect for the higher SES subsample is significantly lower. And if anything, it's negative, but never quite significant. It's not even small, it is negative, um, but not significant. And that's what we're gonna see throughout. Then you can do, do a lot here in terms of your analysis. So this is really just the pure model. We have the outcomes measured in our baseline questionnaire. So you can control for that. It, like increases your R squared uh, substantially. It doesn't affect the treatment effect as it shouldn't because it's an RCT. You can put in 150 uh, dummies for all these randomization pairs. This is super cool. Like you can really like uh, zoom in on this, which like increases your R, R squared like mad and still doesn't change the treatment effect. You can add control groups. That's what you can do. We can look at outcomes like math grades. You find a significant separate effect. Um, Patients and social skills, you find a significant effect mostly on patients, not as clear on social skills, really. Um, and we find the significant effect on whether they already think about uh, an apprenticeship after school. 
Um, let me close with that. We do a lot of robustness analysis. Of course, we do some mediation analysis. Um, you can find all, all of that in the paper with the appendix. This is, I think, 130 pages. So if, you can read the whole book if you want. Um, let me um, uh, quickly summarize. Um, what I think is the main takeaway is that really, what we see even among this highly disadvantaged adolescents, their labor market prospects are malleable at this age. And for this low SES group, we see that this mentoring program increases the labor market prospects by more than half a standard deviation. So uh, this is feasible. And we see that actually a main mediating factor is that um, they establish mentors as attachment figures with whom these, these adolescents can talk and, and who provide guidance for the future. We don't see effects for higher SES adolescents, probably if our interpretation is because here really the lack of uh, adult support is not a major handicap for, for, for in this group. Benefit cost ratios, we calculate them based on the labor market returns to the, these increased uh, uh, math grades from PIAC. Uh, you get a ratio of 15 to 1 for the program in general, or if you were targeted just on low SES, it's twice as large. If you think about scalability, this strong heterogeneity by SES really calls for a strong an importance of targeting to those who really like family support. So this is, I think, important. Beyond that, I mean, this is a group, uh, a program that started from one site and scaled to 40 sites, and our RCT was not focused on un any selected uh, uh, site. So um, I think there is clearly been shown that there's scalability beyond one specific location. We should keep in mind that so far, this is really all university towns and question is uh, how you would implement it in more rural areas. All right, thanks so much for your attention. I look forward and hope that you wanna remember some of your questions for the final, final discussion afterwards.